Saturday, the 1st of January, 1944. Another new year has begun, and we find ourselves still in our hiding place. We have been here now for one year, five months, and 25 days. It seems that our life is at a standstill. The curtain rises on the scene. It is late afternoon. Everyone is bundled up against the cold. In the main room, Mrs. Frank is taking down the laundry which is hung across the back. Mr. Frank sits in the chair down left, reading. Margot is lying on the couch with a blanket over her and the many-colored knitted scarf around her throat. Anne is seated at the center table, writing in her diary. Peter, Mr. and Mrs. Van Don, and Dussel are all in their own rooms, reading or lying down. As the lights dim on, Anne's voice continues, without a break. We are all a little thinner. The Van Don's discussions are as violent as ever. Mother still does not understand me, but then I don't understand her either. There is one great change, however, a change in myself. I read somewhere that girls of my age don't feel quite certain of themselves, that they become quiet within and begin to think of the miracle that is taking place in their bodies. I think that what is happening to me is so wonderful, not only what can be seen, but what is taking place inside. Each time it has happened, I have a feeling that I have a sweet secret. And in spite of any pain, I long for the time when I shall feel that secret within me again. It's Meep. Wake up, everyone. Meep is here. Meep and Mr. Crawler, what a delightful surprise. We came to bring you New Year's greetings. You shouldn't. You should have at least one day to yourselves. Don't say that. It's so wonderful to see them. I can smell the wind and the cold on your clothes. There you are. How are you, Margot? Feeling any better? I'm all right. We filled her full of every kind of pill so she won't cough and make a noise. Well, hello, Meep, Mr. Crawler. With my hope for peace in the new year. Meep, have you seen Mushi? Have you seen him anywhere around? I'm sorry, Peter. I asked everyone in the neighborhood had they seen a gray cat, but they said no. Look what Meep's brought for us. A cake! A cake! I'll get some plates. Thank you, Mipia. You shouldn't have done it. You must have used all of your sugar ration for weeks. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's been ages since I even saw a cake. Not since you brought us one last year. Remember? Don't you remember you gave us one on New Year's Day? Just this time last year? I'll never forget it because you had peace in 1943 on it. Peace in 1944. Well, it has to come sometime, you know. Hello, Mr. Dussel. How are you? Here's the knife, Lefia. Now, how many of us are there? None for me, thank you. Oh, please. You must. I couldn't. Good. That leaves one, two, three, seven of us. Eight! Eight! It's the same number as it always is. I left Margot out. I take it for granted Margot won't eat any. Why wouldn't she? I think it won't harm her. All right, all right. I just didn't want her to start coughing again, that's all. And please, Mrs. Franck should cut the cake. What's the difference? It's not Mrs. Franck's cake, is it, Meep? It's for all of us. Mrs. Franck divides things better. What are you trying to say? Oh, come on, stop wasting time. Don't I always give everybody exactly the same, don't I? Forget it, Carly. No, I want an answer, don't I? Yes, yes, everybody gets exactly the same. Except Mr. Von Don always gets a little bit more. That's a lie. Please, please. That's a lie. Please, please. See what a little sugar cake does to us? It goes right to our heads. Here you are, Mrs. Frank. Thank you. Are you sure you won't have some? No, really, I have to go in a minute. Maybe Mushi went back to our house. They say that cats... Do you ever get over there? I mean, do you suppose you could... I'll try, Peter. The first minute I get, I'll try. But I'm afraid, with him gone a week... Make up your mind. Already someone has had a nice big dinner from that cat. This is delicious, me. Delicious. Dirk's in luck to get a girl who can bake like this. I have to run. Dirk's taking me to a party tonight. How heavenly. Remember now what everyone is wearing and what you have to eat and everything, so you can tell us tomorrow? I'll give you a full report. 
Goodbye, everyone. Just a minute. There's something I'd like you to do for me. Pootie, where are you going? What do you want? Pootie, what are you going to do? What's wrong? Father says he's going to sell her fur coat. She's crazy about that old fur coat. Is it possible? Is it possible that anyone is so silly as to worry about a fur coat in times like this? It's none of your darn business. And if you say one more thing, I'll... I'll take you and I'll... I mean it! I'll... <gasps> no! 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 Don't you dare take that! You hear? It's mine! My father gave me that. You didn't give it to me. You have no right. Let go of it. You hear? <gasps> oh! Just a little discussion over the advisability of selling this coat. As I have often reminded Mrs. Van Don, it's very selfish of her to keep it when people outside are in such desperate need of clothing. So, if you will please to sell it for us, it should fetch a good price. And by the way, will you get me cigarettes? I don't care what kind they are. Get all you can. It's terribly difficult to get them, Mr. Van Don, but I'll try. Goodbye. Are you sure you won't have some cake, Mr. Crawler? I'd better not. You're still feeling badly? What does your doctor say? I haven't been to him. Now, Mr. Crawler! Oh, I tried, but you can't get near a doctor these days. They're so busy. After weeks, I finally managed to get one on the telephone. I told him I'd like an appointment. I wasn't feeling very well. You know what he answers. Over the telephone. Stick out your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> I have some contracts here. I wonder if you'd look over them with me. Of course. If we could go downstairs, will you forgive us? I won't keep him but a minute. What's happened? Something's happened, hasn't it, Mr. Crawler? No, really. I want your father's advice. Something's gone wrong. I know it. If it's something that concerns us here, it's better that we all hear it. But the children... What they'd imagine would be worse than any reality. It's a man in the storeroom. I don't know whether or not you remember him. Carl, about 50, heavy set, nearsighted. He came with us just before you left. He was from Utrecht? That's the man. A couple of weeks ago, when I was in the storeroom, he closed the door and asked me, How's Mr. Frank? What do you hear from Mr. Frank? I told him I only knew there was a rumor that you were in Switzerland. He said he'd heard that rumor too but he thought I might know something more. I didn't pay any attention to it. But then a thing happened yesterday. He'd brought some invoices to the office for me to sign. As I was going through them, I looked up. He was standing, staring at the bookcase. Your bookcase. He said he thought he remembered a door there. Wasn't there a door there that used to go up to the loft? Then he told me he wanted more money. 20 guilders more a week. Blackmail. 20 guilders? Very modest blackmail. That's just the beginning. You know what I think? He was the thief who was down there that night. That's how he knows we're here. How was it left? What did you tell him? I said I had to think about it. What shall I do? Pay him the money? Take a chance on firing him? Or what? I don't know. For God's sake, don't fire him. Pay him what he asks. Keep him here where you can have your eye on him. Is it so much that he's asking? What are they paying nowadays? He could get it in a war plant, but this isn't a war plant. Mind you, I don't know if he really knows or if he doesn't know. Offer him half. Then we'll soon find out if it's blackmail or not. And if it is, we've got to pay it, haven't we? Anything he asks, we've got to pay. L let's decide that when the time comes. This may be all my imagination. You get to a point these days where you suspect everyone and everything. Again and again, on some simple look or word, I found myself... There's the telephone. What does that mean, the telephone ringing on a holiday? That's my wife. I told her I had to go over some papers in my office to call me there when she got out of church. I'll offer him half, then. Goodbye. We'll hope for the best. Goodbye, Goodbye Mr. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mr. Carl. You can thank your son for this, smashing the light. I tell you, it's just a question of time now. Sometimes I wish the end would come. Whatever it is. Margot! Then at least we'd know where we were. You should be ashamed of yourself talking that way. Think how lucky we are. Think of the thousands dying in the war every day. Think of the people in concentration camps. What's the good of that? What's the good of thinking of misery when you're already miserable? That's stupid. Anne? We're young. 
Margot and Peter and I. You grown-ups have had your chance, but look at us. If we begin thinking of all the horror in the world, we're lost. We're trying to hold on to some kind of ideals, when everything, ideals, hopes, everything are being destroyed. It isn't our fault that the world is in such a mess. We weren't around when all this started, so don't try to take it out on us. She talks as if we started the war. Did we start the war? She left her cake. He starts for Anne's room with the cake. There is silence in the main room. Mrs. Van Dan goes up to her room, followed by Mr. Van Dan. Dussel stays looking out the window. Mr. Frank brings Mrs. Frank her cake. She eats it slowly without relish. Mr. Frank takes his cake to Margot and sits quietly on the sofa beside her. Peter stands in the doorway of Anne's darkened room, looking at her, then makes a little movement to let her know he is there. Anne sits up quickly, trying to hide the signs of her tears. Peter holds out the cake to her. You left this. Thanks. I thought you were fine just now. You know just how to talk to them. You know just how to say it. I'm no good. I never can thank, especially when I'm mad. That Dussel, when he said that about Mushi, someone eating him. All I could think is, I wanted to hit him. I wanted to give him such a, a, that he'd, that's what I used to do when there was an argument at school. That's the way I, but here, and an old man like that, it wouldn't be so good. You're making a big mistake about me. I do it all wrong. I say too much. I go too far. I hurt people's feelings. I think you're just fine. What I want to say, if it wasn't for you around here, I don't know. What I mean... Do you mean it, Peter? Do you really mean it? I said it, didn't I? Thank you, Peter. You've got quite a collection. Wouldn't you like some in your room? I could give you some. Heaven knows you spend enough time in there, doing heaven knows what. It's easier. A fight starts or an argument. I duck in there. You're lucky. Having a room to go to? His lordship is always here. I hardly ever get a minute alone. When they start in on me, I can't duck away. I have to stand there and take it. You gave some of it back just now. I get so mad. They form their opinions about everything. But we, we're still trying to find out. We have problems here that no other people our age have ever had. And just as you think you've solved them, something comes along and bang, you have to start all over again. At least you've got someone you can talk to. Not really. Mother, I never discuss anything serious with her. She doesn't understand. Father's all right. We can talk about everything. Everything but one thing, Mother. He simply won't talk about her. I don't think you can be really intimate with anyone if he holds something back, do you? I think your father's fine. Oh, he is, Peter. He is. He's the only one who's ever given me the feeling that I have any sense. But... Anyway, nothing can take the place of school and play and friends of your own age. Or near your age, can it? I suppose you miss your friends and all. It isn't just... <laughs> isn't it funny? You and I. Here we've been seeing each other every minute for almost a year and a half, and this is the first time we've ever really talked. Helps a lot to have someone to talk to, don't you think? It helps you to let off steam. Well, any time you want to let off steam, you can come into my room. I can get up an awful lot of steam. You'll have to be careful how you say that. Oh, it's all right with me. Do you mean it? I said it, didn't I? We've had bad news. The people from whom Meep got our ration books have been arrested, so we have had to cut down on our food. Our stomachs are so empty that they rumble and make strange noises, all in different keys. Mr. Von Don's is deep and low like a bass fiddle. Mine is high, whistling like a flute. As we all sit around waiting for supper, it's like an orchestra tuning up. It only needs Toscanini to raise his baton, and we'd be off in the ride of the Valkyries. Monday the 6th of March, 1944. 
Mr. Crawler is in the hospital. It seems he has ulcers. Pim says we are his ulcers. Meep has to run the business and us too. The Americans have landed on the southern tip of Italy. Father looks for a quick finish to the war. Mr. Dussel is waiting every day for the warehouse man to demand more money. Have I been skipping too much from one subject to another? I can't help it. I feel that spring is coming. I feel it in my whole body and soul. I feel utterly confused. I am longing, so longing, for everything. For friends. For someone to talk to. Someone who understands. Someone young. Who feels as I do.